Hello, welcome back to First Steps in Learning C Sharp, brought to you by Protopic and Realcron Systems. This is Lesson 5, and my name is Roy Fisher. In the last lesson, we were introduced to repetition and iteration by using the for each statement or construct. Today we're going to extend this looping idea and move on to a very powerful construct which is heavily used in programming, and in particular C Sharp. It's called the for loop. Here's our first program. There we see the for statement stripped down to its bare minimum. The skeleton, if you like, of the for construct. Will it work? Well, there's nothing there that says it won't. I've got a for, some kind of expression here with a couple of semicolons and a semicolon at the end. You can't get much better than that. But before I run this, let's just pull over Task Manager, Windows Task Manager. And we can see my processes just now, my CPU usage and sitting about 11 or 12 percent. This is nearly three gig of memory used. Start. There's the console window. That's the output. Not that there's anything on it, as you might expect. And there's our CPU usage. It's shot up to about 20 percent. This program is doing nothing that we can see, apart from eating up valuable computer resources. Luckily, we're in debug mode in Visual Studio. We could close this down by clicking that stop debugging. But if this was actually an application or a part of an application that went into this forever loop, then we'd have to shut it down like this. There is a way that I can break out of this loop by introducing a new C sharp keyword break semicolon is it will stop this infinite looping and jump out. And the program appeared and disappeared as quick as a flash. I've added a few lines so that we can examine more closely what actually happened. I've created an integer variable called outer, which I want to be available inside the loop and outside the loop. As we saw last day, we have to do this outside of the loop. Otherwise, the scope of outer, if it was in here, would not be visible outside. We don't want that. I've added an outer plus plus so that it increments from the zero, one, two, three. I think we can guess it will never get to two or three or four. A console.write line to tell us what the value is. And a read line so we can wait for input. I've run my program confirming, I would hope, that the value of outer at the end was one. Now we've confirmed that, we're going to modify the program. I've added an if statement to make our break conditional before it was unconditional. The code I have is if outer is equal to a thousand, then break. Let's run. And we can see from the output on the console screen that the program did what we expected it to do. I've changed the program and I've given it six different runs, the output of which you can see uh, on the console windows at the side. Now, before we look at the output, let's, let's just have a quick scan of this program to get a feel for its overall structure. Void main as before, in outer, and I'm waiting for something to happen. This forever loop here, well it's clearly not forever, uh, has something, has, a, has an event occurring in it or something happening in here that makes it break out. And this bit here says you've done your stuff. So start, middle and an end of this. And the outputs are, I'm waiting for something to happen, it's happened, and this one took 1,031 loops for this condition to occur. In this one, 7,000 loops, this one only 153, and so on. We have a program then that runs around and gives different outputs. It's certainly not clearly deterministic, it does vary. And that variation could be something external, for example, a bee coming into a hive that has an RFID tag and we're looking for a particular bee, or something. It could be the roll of a dice or anything. But it, it's, it's something that's external, something that we have to keep checking. Get rid of this image, and there's the program. Let's examine our program. I'm going to start here. This expression we know must equate to a true or a false. If something happened, is, if this something happened, open bracket, close brackets, is the same as 42, then this break will occur. Otherwise, it won't. We do know something about this expression in the brackets. We know one, it must equate to true or false. And we know two, the number that we're equating with is the number 42. 
and that number 42 we know to be an integer. Something happened it must be worth an integer and it must in this case be worth 42 for the break to happen. We know something else as well from the shape. This open bracket close bracket we've seen before. For example, read line open bracket close bracket which we know to be a method of the console class tells us there which means that something happened open bracket close bracket is a method and it's a method in fact not of the console class but of our program class our class program which is further up the screen so something happened is 42 so we know that this is a method of the program class and then we also know that it must be an integer somehow let's find out more about something happened I'll right click and go to definition now I've only moved from line 19 to line 28 and it was on the screen all the time but if this is a very large program and comprised hundreds of lines then this go to definition is an invaluable aid let's take a look at our method to help us understand it we're going to compare it with a method that we've seen in every program up to now that of course is the method main I'm going to collapse and toggle the outlining expansion of main so it's sitting at the same level as this as something happened let's compare the similarities and difference of these two methods let's start at the right hand side here we have the opening and closing brackets that are the signature if you like of a method this one is empty this one in main has one argument it's an array of string called args each method has a name each method has a return type something happens returns an integer it has to return an integer otherwise we can't compare it with the number 42 main returns nothing so we use the word void both of them have the same static keyword here we'll find out more about static when we start making our own classes whatever static means there's something we can say about it we know that it works it's worked for main on many occasions and in this program it's working for something happened so that's something that main and something will share and that word sharing is quite important when we're looking at the word static but we'll continue let's open up main and I'll do it by clicking the plus sign here now you may be wondering why I used this right click method before and it's because C Sharp gives us or Visual Studio at least gives us its options about hiding things in fact I can make my own let me just hide this for loop by selecting it right clicking going to outlining and say hide selection let's open up this method and it contains just the one line that line begins with the word return and that return is of type integer when we call or invoke this method as we do here it returns an integer and we can guess I think quite successfully that this integer value that this returns must come from this expression this expression has the characteristic round brackets with stuff in it of a method but where is that method notice there are no red squiggles so this is quite legitimate placing the mouse over the dice roller tells us that it's part of the program notice at the top it says class program this is a method called a dice roller that has been written in here it's in there somewhere and it returns something called a random so where could that be let me right click go to definition and there it is it's been hiding up the top all the time it's something that I wrote earlier this line may look somewhat daunting but it's actually nothing more than something we're already familiar with let me show you an example int x equals 1 semicolon this line both declares a variable x and gives it a value or initializes it to the value 1 comparing this line this initializing declaration with this line 
we can see similarities. We have an assignment equals in the middle. To the left of the assignment, we have the name of a variable. Here I call it the dice roller. To the right of the assignment, we have a value. So here, the value 1. Here, the value that. Whatever that means. It must be a value, even if we don't quite understand it yet. We also have that the variable is of type integer, or int. And here, similarly, dice roller has the type random. Let's look at the use of our variable dice roller. We know one thing, that it's used down here. Let's say I wanted to use x down here. Well, I could possibly substitute that one with an x. Let's try that. And there we can see we get an error. It tells us something about object reference, whatever that means. Let's put a static in front of the word int. Click. Red squiggle disappears. And we'll just check that by pulling over the output. We've still got to get a few more bits of the jigsaw before we can understand static. I've taken the program back to what it was before. If I want to use this variable, dice roller, in a static method, then this dice roller must be static. I have no choice. Let's stand back for a moment. Let's take the trees away from the wood so we can see what I'm trying to do. And I'll put a comment in here that explains broadly what it is. This line here. I hope, returns a random number that simulates the role of a 1,000-sided super dice, the singular of which is die, as you all know. And I do that by invoking, by calling, a method called next of the dice roller variable, which was declared up here as coming from this thing called random. This value that's returned should hopefully be an integer, we defined here, and whatever calls or invokes or uses this something happen method, and that in our case is here, will, once that's been completed, will have an integer value, which sometimes will be 42, but more often than not, will be something else. Dice roller is a variable that, like ourselves, has three stages of life. It's born, it lives, and it passes on. Dice Roller, when it was born, was born with a particular kind of DNA, if that's not too fanciful. That DNA comes from the definition that whoever wrote the random class put into it. So a Dice Roller will inherit these characteristics and actions and abilities from its parent class. It's only when the new keyword in conjunction with this random open bracket close brackets is applied that dice roller is actually brought into existence and memory is allocated for its resources. Before that happens, random is no more than a software cookie cutter. It's this step that actually creates the biscuit. If you don't know what a cookie cutter is, here's some examples. And here's what Microsoft have to say about the random class. Here we can see constructors, random, open bracket, close bracket. That's what we use with the new keyword. And there are two ways of writing a constructor with this random class. In the methods, we can see three versions of the next method. We use the last of these two, next, with a one and a thousand. What this line actually does is it creates from a pattern, a class, it creates an object. And that object has a physical existence inside the memory and processor of the computer. Note that not all classes can be instantiated, which is a fancy way of saying turned into an, an actual object. Indeed, as we'll find out later, a static class cannot be instantiated. We do not use the new keyword with a static class. Just one more thing to add to the jigsaw. Coming back to this method here, um, we saw mentioned in the random information from Microsoft that we had a couple of overloads of this constructor method. 
and we had three overloaded methods of the diceroller.next method. I'm just going to show you that we can create our own overload very easily by copying this code and notice that if I try and run this program it gives me an error. The error says that this program already defines a member called something happened with the same parameter types. So it's not liking it. C-sharp's not liking this yet. And the reason for that, if we want to create an overloaded method, everything to the left of these brackets would, is the same. But what goes in here, which would be the parameters, define something called a signature. This has an empty signature. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put two new variables in. I'm just going to call them a comma and int b. And now when I do that, I want to use a to be the start number of my hypothetical dice. So I'm going to replace that number 1 with an a. And b will be the value of the top level. If I try and run this just now, it works. I've created an overloaded method of something happened, so I've now got two varieties, but I haven't yet used the second one. And in here, I can do that by saying, well, if I want it to be a thousand-sided dice, I can do one comma one thousand. I've inserted a breakpoint here by clicking, and I'm going to run the program and trace through the flow of the program's execution. I run. I arrive here. Without a zero, the first time round, it's about to be incremented, so that will quickly change. And I'll use what I used previously, the step, the step over, which in Visual Studio is the F10. And I'll use that again. Unfortunately, it doesn't allow me to go into this. So I'm going to have to find something a bit better than step over if I want to examine what's happening inside this if statement. And to do that, I use not the step over, but the step into. That's now going to do this. Click, click again, and you can see that yellow highlight to say that the program execution has moved from here to here to here. And if I check the values of A and B, I find that there are 1 and 1,000. Clearly, they've come from there. How did the compiler know that I wanted this version compared with this version? And the answer lies with the signature. The compiler knows that that is an integer, and that is an integer, so it looks for a copy of something happened which has two integer arguments. And that's exactly what I've got here. Notice the names don't matter. It's the types that matter. So if I said int b, comma a, it wouldn't make the slightest bit of difference. So now that means is that the values 1 and 1,000 are now going to be used here. In fact, exactly the same results I've got here. But there's a lot more flexibility, because if I wanted, I could make it a 100-sided dice by changing that to 100. Now it's not hard-wired in. It's loosely wired in. Of course, if I made that one in six, it would be no new dice, but I think you can see that the program may run for some time yet. In the next lesson, I want to extend our understanding of C Sharp, and I'll be doing that predominantly by creating a class based on this. I also want to go back and flesh out many of the things that I've missed on the way here. Until then, goodbye.